Hello, friend, and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, the original Tudor history podcast going since 2009. I am your host, Heather Tesco. I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being much more deeply in touch with our own humanity. So today, this is episode 225, I believe, and we are talking about royal weddings because the Tudors got excited about royal weddings just like we do. We're going to be talking about some of the most famous royal weddings of the 16th century. Just one quick note, I haven't talked about it much on this podcast because I've done it in my email list and on my YouTube channel, but I am down to about 25 tickets to TudorCon left. TudorCon is happening September 20th to 22nd at H. Croft Hall in Richmond, Virginia. It's an actual Tudor home that was brought over by a wealthy tobacco farmer who wanted to live in a Tudor house. So as one does, uh, he sent his architect to England to look for actual Tudor homes that he could bring over, and they found H. Croft Hall and brought it over and reconstructed it piece by piece. So we're going to have Tudor Con there. Um, it's selling very quickly. I have about maybe 25 tickets left as I'm recording this. So if you want to reserve your spot, englandcast.com slash TudorCon will get you all the information you need to know about that. All right. Let's get right into it. Similarly to today, royal weddings in Tudor England were not just celebrations of love, but they were political events that shaped the political landscape of England and beyond. These matrimonial alliances were strategic tools wielded to forge international partnerships, secure peace treaties, and consolidate power within the realm. As we delve into the opulent and intrigue-filled world of Tudor nuptials, we will uncover how these grand unions were instrumental in dictating the course of English and European history, weaving together the personal and the political in a dance of diplomacy and dynastic ambition. Let's start out with the marriage of Elizabeth of York to Henry VII. This marked not only a union of hearts, but also the confluence of warring factions, bringing to an end the turbulent period known as the Wars of the Roses. This protracted series of conflicts, which had ravaged England from 1455-ish to 1487, pitted the houses of Lancaster and York against each other in a bloody struggle for the English throne. The need for a unifying marriage became apparent as the country yearned for stability after decades of factional violence and political upheaval. And just a super quick note that last month, Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members at a certain level got a free e-course that was the introduction to the Wars of the Roses. So if you want to dig into the Wars of the Roses more, you're new to it, you don't know a lot about it, you can join my YouTube channel or Patreon. There's links in the show notes and check out that e-course. This month's course is going to be uh, Henry VII and his consolidation of power. So that's fun. So Henry VII was a Lancastrian claimant who had lived in exile for most of his life, and he seized the throne at the Battle of Bosworth Field by force in 1485, where he defeated Richard III, the last Yorkist king. However, Henry was acutely aware that his claim to the throne was tenuous at best and that he needed to cement his position to ensure the longevity of his reign and the stability of his realm. One solution which had been negotiated by the mothers was marrying Elizabeth of York, the eldest daughter of Edward IV and the niece of Richard III, thereby uniting the rival houses and legitimizing his rule through association with the Yorkist line. The wedding took place, it should be noted, after Henry was crowned already, in January of 1486 at Westminster Abbey, a location steeped in royal tradition and sanctity. The choice of venue was symbolic, underscoring the gravity and significance of the occasion. The ceremony was a lavish affair, attended by the nobility and celebrated throughout the realm. It was not merely a wedding, but a public declaration of the dawn of a new era, symbolized by the creation of the Tudor Rose, a heraldic emblem 
that merged the white rose of York with the red rose of Lancaster, representing the unity and healing of the nation. The impact of this marriage on the establishment of the Tudor dynasty cannot be overstated. Elizabeth of York's gentle demeanor and royal blood lent legitimacy and a sense of continuity to Henry's reign, while her fertility ensured the succession of the Tudor line. Their union produced seven children, four of whom survived infancy, including the future Henry VIII and Margaret Tudor, whose marriage into the Scottish royal family would have far-reaching consequences for the history of the British Isles. Moreover, the marriage of Elizabeth and Henry laid the foundations for a period of relative peace and prosperity in England. It heralded the end of the internecine conflict and the beginning of the Tudor Renaissance, a time of cultural flourishing and exploration that would define the age. The stability brought about by this union allowed for the consolidation of royal power, the establishment of effective governance, and the fostering of a sense of national identity that transcended the old rivalries. In essence, the marriage of Elizabeth of York and Henry VII was a masterstroke of political strategy that transformed the landscape of English politics. It healed a divided nation, established a new royal dynasty, a pivotal period in English history, obviously, that would see the country emerge as a significant power on the European stage. The legacy of this union, both in terms of its immediate political impact and its symbolic value, remains a testament to the profound influence of royal marriages in shaping the destiny of nations. Now let's talk about one of Henry VIII's marriages, his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. It was a union steeped in political strategy, of course, with the emerging England wanting to cement an alliance between England and Spain. Spain was much more powerful, but of course England was growing now with the relative peace after the Wars of the Roses. Catherine was the youngest surviving child of Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabella I of Castile. She was not only a Spanish princess, but also the widow of Henry's elder brother, Arthur, Prince of Wales, whose untimely death left the Spanish alliance in jeopardy. Of course, Catherine first came to England to marry Arthur, Prince of Wales. They were married in Old St. Paul's Cathedral in 1501. They were both just 15. And Henry VII threw an amazing wedding. And actually, the service lasted so long that they had to interrupt it to serve refreshments because that's how long it was going. Catherine had been escorted by the groom's 10-year-old brother, Prince Henry, who would, of course, then marry Catherine himself eight years later. But for the purposes of this segment, we are going to talk about Catherine's marriage to Henry, which was, of course, as much about preserving this vital alliance as it was about securing the Tudor succession. They required a papal dispensation for the marriage, because of their close kinship. And while they had secured that dispensation, Henry VII had kind of sat on it for several years, waiting to see what exactly he would do. But then when he passed away, Henry ascended to the throne. He married her right away on June 11th, 1509, just weeks after he became king. It was a grand affair that symbolized not only their personal union, but also the joining of these two mighty European powers. So the wedding between Henry and Catherine was actually a small private affair held in the Church of the Observant Friars outside of Greenwich Palace. Two weeks after their marriage, Henry and Catherine were crowned together. And it was very unusual for kings and queens to be crowned together. There would not be another joint coronation in the British Isles until that of James II of England with his wife Mary, nearly two centuries later. It was an event of unparalleled splendor designed to showcase the wealth and cultural sophistication of the Tudor court. The streets were decorated, houses and shops had tapestries hanging, some even with cloth of gold, and the crowds were so large 
that they actually had to put up barricades and railings in the street to prevent people from interfering with the procession. Westminster Abbey was adorned with the finest decorations and thronged by nobility from across Europe, providing the setting for this spectacle. Ceremonies were not just celebrations of a new king and queen, but also public displays of the Tudor monarchy's stability and legitimacy. And in that ceremony, the king and queen participated in their royal entry, their triumphant procession from the tower to Westminster to the acclaim of the people. Henry made his entrance riding a horse in gold damask and ermine, and above him was a golden canopy carried by the barons of the sink ports. Henry was wearing robes of crimson and velvet, trimmed with ermine over a gold jacket covered with a breathtaking amount of sparkling diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and pearls. After his procession came that of the queens. She sat in a litter supported by two white horses adorned with a white cloth of gold, and she was wearing white satin that was embroidered, wearing her hair down, and a coronet with many rich stones. Of course, these celebrations were a wonderful start to Henry's reign and to the marriage, but the long-term success of the marriage, of course, wasn't. Um, The lack of the male heir, despite numerous pregnancies, placed immense strain on the royal marriage and the political alliance that it symbolized. Henry's growing desperation for a son who could secure the Tudor dynasty's future eventually led to England's break with the Roman Catholic Church and the establishment of the Church of England. Catherine's steadfast refusal to annul the marriage, Henry's subsequent marriage to Anne Boleyn, not only ended the Spanish alliance, but also initiated a period of religious and political turmoil in England. The dissolution of the monasteries, the establishment of royal supremacy over the church, and the persecution of those who opposed the new order were direct consequences of this marital breakdown. The union began with such promise and pageantry, but it ended in a schism that altered the course of English history, laying the groundwork for a period of religious conflict and transformation that would define the Tudor period. Now let's talk about some of Henry's other notable marriages. His quest for a male heir and his tumultuous love life led to a series of marriages that had profound implications for Tudor England, particularly his unions with Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour. Anne Boleyn's entrance, of course, we all know into Henry's life ignited a chain of events that would lead to one of the most significant religious transformations in English history. Unlike Catherine of Aragon, Anne was a lady-in-waiting, not a foreign princess, and her betrothal to Henry was fraught with controversy from the start. The king's infatuation with Anne and his desperate need for a son led to the annulment of his marriage with Catherine despite the Pope's refusal. This defiance against the Vatican marked the beginning of the English Reformation and the establishment of the Church of England with Henry at its head. And officially recognized in 1533 was as much a political maneuver as it was a romantic union. Anne's Protestant sympathies and her role in the religious reform movement further alienated the Catholic factions and aligned England with Protestant states in Europe. However, again, the union's failure to produce a male heir, save for daughter Elizabeth and Anne's subsequent fall from grace leading to her execution in 1536, underscored the volatile nature of Henry's marital and political alliances. In stark contrast to the tumultuous marriage with Anne, Henry's union with Jane Seymour represented a return to traditional values and a momentary political stabilizing force. Jane was also a lady-in-waiting to Henry's previous queens, was seen as a more demure and compliant figure, qualities that Henry, embittered by his previous marriages, found appealing. So I will say, I did a YouTube video on her and whether she really had more spirit than we give her credit for, because she was only queen for a short amount of time. But she did stick up for the rebels in the Pilgrimage of Grace, which took a lot of guts. Anyway, married just days after Anne Boleyn's execution, Jane's marriage to Henry was pivotal for its fulfillment of Henry's most fervent desire, the birth of a male heir. In 1537, 
Jane gave birth to the future Edward VI, securing the Tudor succession and momentarily solidifying Henry's political standing both domestically and abroad. Unlike Anne's push for religious reform, Jane's influence was less pronounced in political and religious matters, reflecting the traditional role expected of Queen's consort at the time. However, Jane's death shortly after childbirth cast a shadow over the brief period of stability her marriage had brought. The loss of Jane deeply affected Henry, who mourned her for an extended period and celebrated her as his most cherished wife, largely because she provided him with the much-coveted male heir. So we're going to move on now and talk about another royal wedding, that of Henry's daughter Mary, Mary I to Philip II of Spain in 1554. It was a union fraught with religious and political implications, reflective of the turbulent times that characterized Mary's reign. Known as Bloody Mary for her fervent Catholicism and persecution of Protestants, Mary sought to reverse the Protestant reforms initiated by her father and furthered under her brother Edward VI. Her marriage to Philip II, a devout Catholic and the son of Emperor Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire, was emblematic of her commitment to restoring Catholicism in England and realigning the country with the major Catholic powers of Europe. Mary's ascension to the throne in 1553 brought with it a decisive shift in England's religious landscape. Her staunch Catholicism stood in stark contrast to the Protestant leanings that had taken root under the reigns of her predecessors. The marriage to Philip II was not merely a personal alliance, but also a strategic move to cement Catholic power in England and garner the support of Spain, one of the most formidable Catholic kingdoms. This alliance was pivotal given the Habsburg dynasty's influence over European politics and its role as the bulwark of Catholicism. The wedding took place in July 1554 at Winchester Cathedral, a ceremony marked by grandeur and solemnity befitting a royal union of such significant international consequences. We have an account of the wedding written by John Elder, who was from Scotland, as a letter to Robert Stewart, who was a bishop. There were also several narratives of the marriage published in English, Spanish, Italian, German, and Dutch intended to celebrate the glory of the Habsburgs and the benefits of the marriage to England and Catholic Europe. So Philip arrived in Winchester on the 23rd of July, riding through the rain on a white horse. He changed horses at the Hospital of St. Cross, went to the cathedral and then to his lodgings in the dean's house. Philip could reach Mary by a spiral staircase from the castle garden, and apparently Mary taught Philip how to say good night to the English lords. Then the couple walked in the water meadows by the river Itchen, and then a day later, Mary sent her tailor to Philip to set up his clothing, his cloaks and everything like that. Then they were married on the 25th, of July on the Feast of St. James, which is the patron saint of Spain. Both Philip and Mary were dressed in rich cloth of gold, and Mary wore many valuable jewels on her head and her body. Of course, there were a lot of concerns about a foreign prince coming in, and then because, of course, obviously at the time, men ruled their wives, anyone who was a queen, her husband, would supposedly become king and would be in charge because he couldn't have a woman in charge like obviously duh so after they were married they were proclaimed in latin french and english as king and queen of england france naples jerusalem and ireland defenders of the faith princes of spain and sicily archdukes of austria dukes of milan burgundy brabant counts of Habsburg, flanders and tyrol so that probably would have been very disconcerting to the lords in England who weren't thrilled with the idea of a Spanish prince becoming their king. The public's apprehension was further fueled by the marriage treaty, which was carefully negotiated to protect England's sovereignty, stipulating that Philip would be titled King of England but would not hold the same authority as Mary. And when you look at coins from this time, it shows Mary in front of Philip. So they tried to say, like, look, he might be the king, but she is actually the one in charge. 
still people were very upset and that led to Wyatt's rebellion and, and some other rebellions against Mary. Plus, Mary's reign saw the reinstatement of the Heresy Acts and the Marian persecutions, which sought to purge England of Protestant influence, efforts that were emboldened by her alliance with Philip. Philip's involvement in English matters waned after Mary's death, marking a shift in Spain's influence over England. The marriage, while initially seen as a potential means of securing a Catholic stronghold in England, had limited long-term effects on the country's religious orientation, with Elizabeth I's ascension heralding a new era of Protestant consolidation. And the final marriage we're going to talk about is that of James VI of Scotland, later James I of England, to Anne of Denmark in 1589, marking a significant transition from the Tudor to the Stuart era, and weaving together the destinies of Scotland, England, and Scandinavia. James's ascension to the English throne in 1603 united the crowns of Scotland and England and was a pivotal moment in British history, facilitated in part by his marriage to Anne. This union not only reinforced James's position in Scotland, but also played a crucial role in his peaceful succession to the English throne, marking the end of the Tudor dynasty and beginning the Stuart role over a united kingdom. Before we talk about the wedding, though, Hannah wants to say hi. Hi. Also, I know this doesn't have video, but imagine mom having bunny ears. You're gonna you're gonna put virtual bunny ears yeah. on. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Hi. Bye. Thank you for listening to mom's team. Thanks for listening to mom's podcast. Bye. All right. The wedding of James and Anne is a tale of romance, adventure, and international diplomacy, marking a significant union in European royal history. Anne's voyage to Scotland was nothing short of dramatic. Within 10 days of setting sail, her fleet, commanded by Admiral Peter Monk, encountered a series of misfortunes culminating in a forced retreat to the Norwegian coast due to storms. The journey by land to Oslo, where Anne sought refuge, was accompanied by notable members of the Scottish and Danish embassies, And then the alarming news of the fleet's troubles reached James, prompting widespread concern and national calls for prayer. The king, stationed at Seton Palace, anxiously awaited Anne's arrival, and his worry for her safety inspired him to compose heartfelt songs and letters. One of these letters, written in French, conveyed James's deep fears and his longing for Anne's safe passage. In a move that has been described as the one romantic episode of his life, James embarked on a personal mission to fetch Anne, leaving from Leith with a retinue of 300 people. He arrived in Oslo in November, was marked by a touching reunion where, despite Anne's initial protests, James greeted her with a kiss in the traditional Scottish fashion, showcasing the depth of their bond. The formal wedding took place four days later in Oslo in the old bishop's palace, a setting that was adorned to reflect the occasion's grandeur. Conducted in French by Leith Minister David Lindsay, the ceremony was a blend of Scottish and Danish customs, celebrating the union of the godly and beautiful princess Anne with James. After a month of celebration and a visit to Anne's family at Kronberg Castle, the newlyweds embarked on their journey back to Scotland aboard a ship called the Gideon. They arrived in May. Their arrival was met with grandeur, including Anne's state entry into Edinburgh in a magnificent silver coach. James's solitary attendance at a sermon shortly after their arrival hinted at the traditional customs at the time, while Anne's lavish entry showcased the union's significance. So that is it for our look at five royal marriages during the Tudor period, starting with Henry VII and Elizabeth, and then ending with Henry's descendant, James, and his marriage to Anne of Denmark. There's a reason we all love a royal wedding. They are a mix of love, power, and diplomacy, mixed with grandeur and beautiful dresses. And of course, royal weddings during the Tudor period were no different than royal weddings today. So, During Love Month, I thought we should talk about royal weddings, and there we are. Okay, my friends, remember TudorCon? 
englandcast.com slash TudorCon to learn more and get your ticket. Thank you so much for considering coming. And to those of you who come, I cannot wait to meet you. Like I said, we only have about 25, 26 seats left. So make sure you grab your spot if you want to come. All right, my friends, thank you so much for listening. Have an amazing week and I will be back again next week. Next week's episode is going to be on royal mistresses. So that'll be fun. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Blow northern wind, a sandal baby sweating.